so when we ended uh, last time, uh, we were looking for a nonlinear theory of massive gravity. And the, the two questions that we wanted to answer was, first of all, is there a nonlinear theory uh, that is free of this Boulevard Desert ghost? So does it propagate only the five degrees of freedom appropriate to the massive graviton? So this is a, a question of theoretical consistency. And the second question that we wanted to answer, once we have such a theory, uh, is whether or not this theory exhibits this Weinstein mechanism. So in other words, at short distances, do we recover the predictions of general relativity? Uh, and thus, is this a phenomenologically viable theory or not? So before going on uh, to, to answer these questions, uh, I wanted to take a brief uh, interlude uh, to either introduce or review some mathematical formalism. Um, this is probably stuff that you guys have seen before. However, I just wanted to go through it quickly uh, to give some background. So this will be a, a formal interlude. And I want to emphasize that this formalism isn't required uh, for writing down these theories of massive gravity, for the ghost-free theories of massive gravity. Um, but I'm introducing it for two reasons. So the first reason uh, is that it enables you uh, to write down theories of massive gravity in a particularly simple formulation. So it's useful in that regard. But the second reason that I'm introducing it uh, is it also helps put these theories of massive gravity into a bit of historical context. So by introducing this formalism, we'll be able to see how these, these massive gravity theories, in fact, are very closely related to Lovelock theories, which are other generalizations um, of general relativity. All right, so let's go ahead. Uh, so the first, the first formalism that I wanted to introduce slash review uh, is that of differential forms. So in general relativity, uh, we're used to working in what's known as a coordinate basis. And what this means is that we can use differential line elements by which I mean some dx mu, to form the basis of a vector space. So these become basis vectors. So we do this when we write down, for example, a covariant vector. So some v, which is equal to some coefficients, say v mu, times these basis vectors, d mu x. And in fact, we're so casual uh, with using this basis that we often refer to the coefficients themselves, the v mu, as the covariant vector. Um, but the understanding is always that these are, these are the coefficients uh, in this basis here as well. All right, but now I'm going to be explicit, uh, and I'm going to hang on to these, these basis vectors, the dx mu, when I write anything out here. All right, so for reasons that will become clear, uh, these dx mu's uh, are often referred to also as one forms. All right, so we can construct a two form by introducing an exterior product, uh, also known as the wedge product, between two one forms. So the product of two one forms will look like the following. So a two-form W, we can write as U wedge V, where these guys are both one-forms. All right, so this is what we mean by the wedge product, or the exterior product. Now, the key feature of the wedge product is that it's an anti-symmetric product. So we have that U wedge V is always equal to minus V wedge you, like so. And by this definition, of course, it means that the wedge product of any two one forms together, sorry, these are both u's, is always going to be equal to zero. Okay, so conceptually, 
the magnitude of two one forms can be thought of as the area of a parallelogram whose sides are the length of u and v. So if we have one vector v and another vector u, the wedge product u wedge v is going to be equal to the parallelogram formed by this guy here. All right, so we'll see that there's something related to wedge products and in general area elements, uh, and as you go up to three forms, to volume elements as well. So in particular, the differential line elements These are differential one forms. And the two forms, so suppose I have two of them, say dx and dy. The two form formed by wedging them together, so dx wedge dy, has the properties of a differential area element. And the best way to see this is the following. So suppose I start out with these two uh, differential one forms, dx and dy, uh, and I want to perform a change of variables. So let me take x and y, and let me perform a change of variables to some x prime. That's a function of x and y, and also some y prime. That's a function of x and y as well. OK, so we know how the differential line elements are going to transform. So dx prime should be equal to partial dx prime dx, dx, partial dx prime dy, dy, whereas we have dy prime is going to be equal to partial dy prime dx, dx, plus partial dy prime dy, dy, like so. So this means that when I write the wedge product now of the new variables dx prime dy prime, I'm wedging these two things together with each other. So we know that the wedge product uh, of two of the same one forms is going to give us zero. So the only terms that we have to pay attention to are the ones that we get from wedging dy with dx and dx with dy. So this is going to be equal to dx prime dx times dy prime dy dx wedge dy, and then I'm also going to get a plus dx prime dy, dy prime dx times dy wedge dx. But of course, this is just minus dx dy. And so what I find is exactly the Jacobian of this transformation uh, appearing in front of the two forms. So dx prime dx, dy prime dy, minus dx prime dy, dy prime dx, all times dx, wedge dy. All right. So this is the Jacobian here. All right, very good. So basic properties of the wedge product. So the wedge product in general uh, can be used to construct forms higher than a two form. So to make a general, say, p plus q form, Uh, we simply wedge together some p form and some q form. So in general, we're going to have, say, w of rank p plus q is going to be equal to, say, some m of rank p wedged with some form uh, of rank q. So this is a p form. This is going to be a q form. So this is a p plus q form. 
And in general, this is going to obey the anti-symmetry property, uh, that this is going to be equal to minus 1 to the p times q, nq wedge mp. All right, where p, q, and p plus q, we call the rank of these forms. All right, so I'm going pretty quickly here, um, but I'm assuming that this is something that most of you have already seen before, and I just want to give a bit of a refresher here. All right, so note that because, the anti, because of the anti-symmetry property uh, of this wedge product, the size of the form, the rank of a form that you can construct um, is always restricted by the number of dimensions that you're in. So if I'm in a theory that has, say, four space-time dimensions, I can only construct a four form at the most because I only can wedge together four different line elements at a time. So in particular, we could consider, say, a space that has three spatial dimensions. In this case, there's only a limited number of types of forms that I can write down. So we can categorize the most general forms that I can write down uh, in a space that has three spatial dimensions. So a zero form is just going to be some function that depends on my three coordinates, say some function f, y, and z. And that's the most general zero form that I can write down. The most general one form that I can write down is something with arbitrary coefficients that multiplies the dx, the dy, and dz. So I can write down some g1 of x, y, z times dx plus some g2 of x, y, z dy plus g3 x, y, z of dz, like so. And to simplify this, I can write this notationally as say some gi of x, y, and z uh, dx i, like so. Uh, let me do the other ones over here. All right, I'm still considering a three-dimensional space. The most general two-form that I can write down is going to take the following form. So I can have three functions. Let me call them h, 1, 2, x, y, z. That's going to multiply a dx wedge dy plus h, 2, 3 of x, y, z that multiplies dy wedge dz and an h, 3, 1 x, y, z that multiplies uh, d, z wedge dx. And of course, I can write this more compactly as some h, i, j, dx, i, dx, j. And finally, I have a three form, which is going to be characterized by only one coefficient. So let's call it some m, 1, 2, 3, x, y, z that's going to multiply dx wedge dy wedge dz. And I can express this as some m i j k dx i wedge dx j wedge dx k, like so. And I'm not being very careful with overall factors in front here. All right, but that's it for a three-dimensional space because there's no four form that I can write down uh, because that would involve wedging together, say, two dx's or two dy's. So this summarizes all the possible kinds of forms that we can write down uh, in three spatial dimensions. All right, so the next important operation besides the wedge product uh, is that of the exterior derivative. So the exterior derivative uh, is an operation that takes a p form to a p, a p plus 1 form in the following way. So if I start out with some function, so some 0 form f, then the exterior derivative d of f, x, y, z, is going to be equal to df dx i dx i, like so. So this is a zero form 
going to a one form. For a one form going to a two form, uh, we can write, say, D, and now we're going to have D of, say, G, I, D, X, I. Actually, let me make these J's for simplicity. So this is going to be equal to D, G, J, D, X, I, D, X, I, wedge G, X, J, like so. And you can see how the pattern is going to continue for higher forms here. Uh, so I can let me do one more. So this was the exterior derivative taking a one form to a two form. And let's see what it looks like to take a two form to a three form. So there we can write uh, d. Uh, and I'm going to use the same variables that I introduced here. So d, h, j, k, dx, j, wedge dx, k. This is going to be equal to partial uh, d, h, j, k, dx, i. And now I'm going to have dx, i, wedge dx, j, wedge dx, k, like so. All right, but these should look a little bit familiar, right? So if we consider this three-dimensional uh, space, this process here, this is simply a vector that I've ended up on this side whose coefficients depend on the derivatives of the function x. So in fact, this is the same thing basically as just taking the gradient of f. Whereas this here, so now I can also think of this as a vector in three space uh, that points in the say k direction if this is i and j. But because this is anti-symmetric and i and j, this is like taking the curl of g here. So this is curl of this function g. Whereas here, in three space, I can think of this as a scalar, basically, because I have only one one form, or sorry, only one three form in three space. So this is a scalar, and in fact, this is like taking the divergence of h, like so. All right, so an important property of the exterior derivative is that taking the exterior derivative twice of any form always gives you 0. So of some w, p is always equal to 0. And we see how this plays out uh, in terms of these functions here. So this statement here is just equivalent to the usual vector identities that curl of a gradient is equal to 0, and also that divergence of a curl is equal to 0. Curl of g is equal to 0, like so. All right, so those are the main properties that I wanted to introduce. Uh, in relation to these differential forms. Uh, are there any questions about this? OK, very good. So the next bit of formalism I wanted to introduce was the notion of tetrads here. So we started out by introducing this coordinate basis. In which the dx mu uh, were the basis vectors of our tangent space. But we can introduce a different basis instead. Uh, in particular, we can introduce an orthonormal basis. and denote the basis vectors by some EA. And what we mean here by orthonormal is the usual definition um, up to the appropriate signature of the metric. So we want to be taking inner products of these guys um, that reflect the correct signature of the metric. So in other words, what we mean by orthonormal here is that if I take the inner product of two of these basis vectors, say an EA, and an EB, 
and I use the metric uh, to define the inner product, this should be equal to some eta AB, like so. Okay, so this is the definition that we're taking. So we can express the new basis vectors in terms of the old basis vectors, uh, simply by writing EA is equal to some E mu A dx mu, like so. So express new basis vectors in terms of old. And now this matrix E mu A, uh, this is going to be a four by four invertible matrix. And it's often referred to as the tetrad. So you'll also hear other words as well. Um, it's occasionally referred to as the Wielbein. In four dimensions, it's also referred to as a Wierbein. In three dimensions, it's a Drybein. And I think in two dimensions, it's a Zweibein. Uh, I'm going to refer to them as tetrads throughout here. All right, so we have this four by four invertible matrix. Uh, we can define the inverse of the matrix then. So the inverse is going to be denoted by E mu with upper indices, A lower index. Uh, and the property of the inverse should be such that both E mu A, E mu B is equal to Kronecker delta AB. And likewise, E mu A, E nu B should be equal to Kronecker delta mu nu, like so. So written in terms of these inverse matrices, sorry, written in terms of these four by four matrices, this requirement here, so the orthogonality requirement can be expressed in the following way. Yeah. Ah, uh, A, thank you. Yes. Uh, so we can re-express this orthogonality requirement in terms of these four by four matrices. Uh, so the, this is basically just saying that E mu A E nu B, G mu nu should be equal to eta AB. Like so. That's all that we mean here. And we can rearrange this uh, just by multiplying by inverse matrices and inverse Vierbeins uh, to express this as G mu nu is equal to E mu A, E nu B, eta AB. So these are the same things here. All right, so the main points about this tetrad matrix. So the first thing uh, is that even if you don't care about any of this, the mathematical formalism, what we're basically doing is we're defining some matrix that's essentially like a square root of a metric. So you can think of the tetrad is like a square root. But there's another way to think about it as well. Um, we can also think of it as a transformation that takes us from a locally inertial frame, so some frame where I can define uh, a flat matrix, A to AB, uh, to some non-inertial coordinates, G mu nu, as well. So in particular, if at every point, denoted by some capital X, say, we construct a set of coordinates Uh, and let's call those coordinates Xi of capital X with index alpha uh, that are locally inertial at X. At capital X. Then the metric, uh, can you guys read if I write down here? It's okay. Okay, so then 
the metric is given by, again, g mu nu equals e mu a of little x e nu b of little x a to a b, where now we can define e mu a at the point capital X is going to be equal to the coordinate transformation d psi x alpha of little x dx uh, dx mu evaluated at x is equal to capital X, like so. OK. Which is all to say, again, um, that we can treat these tetrads as the transformation taking us from a locally inertial frame uh, to the full curved metric as well. Okay. Important properties of this tetrad. Okay, so note that the tetrad is really four covariant vectors. Rather than a tensor. And what I mean by this is the following. So if I do a general coordinate transformation, so if I take x uh, mu to some x prime mu equal to x mu, uh, well, just let's leave it at x prime mu like so, um, then only the mu index of the tetrad is going to transform. So in other words, I treat the A index as labeling four vectors, each that have mu index. So the tetrad is going to transform like E mu A goes to E mu A prime, which is equal to D x nu, D x mu prime, E mu, uh, E nu A, like so. OK, so we're only transforming this index here. Uh, so in general, I'm going to refer to the mu index uh, as the space-time index. But notice, on the other hand, that the definition of the tetrad is unique only up to an overall local Lorentz invariance. In other words, I can transform the A index of the tetrad by a local Lorentz transformation and end up with the same metric, g mu nu. So in other words, if I define now an E mu prime A that's equal to lambda AB, E mu B, like so, and I stick it into this definition uh, where I write G mu nu in terms of the tetrad, uh, then I have that G mu nu prime is going to be equal to, I'm going to have two Lorentz transformations, uh, so A C B d uh, e mu c e nu d eta a b. But of course, the two lambdas combined with the etas uh, just gives me an eta c d. So this is e mu uh, c e nu d eta c d, which is, of course, just equal to my original g mu nu, like so. So I also have this, this Lorentz invariance as well. All right, in fact, um, this invariance is really important uh, and makes sense if we want to count degrees of freedom or count components in these theories. So we're starting from a theory uh, that has a metric 
which we said before because the metric is a four by four symmetric rank two tensor. This has 10 components contained in it. But now we're saying, okay, but we can also express it in terms of these tetrad variables, um, which are also four by four matrices, but are not constrained to be symmetric. And so in fact, the tetrad has 16 components in it. So in order to get this equation to balance in terms of components, we see that it's precisely the six components contained in the Lorentz transformation that I can use to get rid of the six extra components of the tetrad here as well. So the Lorentz transformation here contains, of course, three rotations and three boosts. And I can use these always uh, to kill six components of the tetrad uh, and end up with the same 10 components of the metric that I want as well. All right, very good. All right, so this index A, so if mu is the space-time index, uh, I'm gonna refer to A as the Lorentz index of the tetrad. So finally, I just wanna note that tetrads are more than just a mathematical uh, formalism, a mathematical curiosity. If we want to talk about spinners in curved space time, we're in fact forced to introduce tetrads rather than just the metric instead. Um, and this is because in order to describe a spinner, spinners are really only defined as representations of the Poincaré group. If you have a curved space time, uh, you no longer have Poincaré invariance. And so you need to set up locally inertial coordinate systems at every point in space in order to define spinners on a curved background. And so formally what this looks like is that if we want to go from, say, the Dirac equation uh, in flat space time to in curved space time, that means that we have to take, say, the Dirac gamma matrices, which are defined with a Lorentz index. And we can use the tetrad to promote this Lorentz index to a true space time index. So we can define a gamma matrix gamma mu, which is just equal to E mu A gamma A, like so. All right, which means that now we can write the Dirac equation uh, in terms of these new gamma mu matrices. So we could have some I, now gamma mu, covariant derivative mu minus M psi equals to zero. And the point is that this covariant derivative uh, is of course already a tensor, and so we need to introduce uh, the gamma mu in such a way that this also transforms as a space-time tensor as well, a space-time vector. Okay, I'm going very fast. Are there any questions about this? Yes. Yeah, so, so in fact, okay, so, th so the question was, uh, what we've described about massive gravity so far, you don't have a general covariance, uh, so what's the relationship uh, between these massive gravity theories and geometry? Um, and so yeah, I guess I, I guess I would argue that you're right, uh, there's no longer this, this beautiful diff invariance of the theory. Nevertheless, we're gonna see that they can still be elegantly constructed in terms of these, of these forms. And though, so there's some sort of, topological inspiration behind these theories um, without these mass terms really being topological terms. Yeah. But hopefully that'll, it'll become more clear. Okay, are there other questions about this? Okay, so before again moving on uh, to massive gravity, uh, what I wanna do now is I just wanna in fact go through general relativity in terms of this new formalism here uh, and talk about how uh, the structures that we've, been, we've introduced here uh, can in fact be used to write GR in a very compact and elegant notation.
All right, so in order to see what GR looks like uh, in this new formalism, uh, I'm going to introduce the following sort of dictionary between the two theories. Okay, so our starting place, so this is going to be GR, and this is going to be tetrad one forms. Uh, so I should say this is GR uh, with metrics and index notation. So compared to GR with tetrads and one form. Okay, so the idea is that instead of writing down the metric G mu nu, we replace it like we said uh, with a tetrad one form EA, which is equal to E mu A DX mu, like so. Uh, in GR, we also usually introduce the Christoffel connection. So gamma mu nu lambda. In the language of these one forms, instead we introduce what's known as the spin connection one form. And it's denoted by some omega AB, which is equal to omega mu AB dx mu. So remember that the rank of the form always counts the number of space-time indices, and it's independent of the number of Lorentz indices. So both E and omega are one forms because they have one space-time index, even though they have different numbers of Lorentz indices here as well. All right. In place of the Riemann curvature tensor, so R rho sigma mu nu, we use instead a curvature two form. So the curvature two form carries two Lorentz indices, RAB, and it's equal to uh, an index notation, RAB mu nu, dx mu, wedge dx nu, like so. And it's expressed always in terms of the spin connection omega, so that RAB is equal to D, so this is our exterior derivative, omega AB plus omega AC, wedge omega uh, C B, like so. Uh, and just to be sure that our counting is right, just to check, so we're saying this is a curvature two form, it has two space-time indices. Uh, omega is a one form, if I act with a D operation, that gives me a two form here. If I wedge together two one forms, that also gives me a two form here. So in fact, quick check just to make sure that this is indeed a two form. All right. The covariant derivative So nabla mu, we're going to replace by an operation capital D uh, that carries no index, but is defined in terms of uh, the exterior derivative and also the spin connection one forms. So when taking derivatives with respect to this D, the D carries, cares only about uh, the number of Lorentz indices on your form. It doesn't care about the rank of the form at all. Uh, so in other words, if I take D of some zero form phi, this is just going to be equal to D phi, the usual exterior derivative. If I take D of some form uh, which only carries one Lorentz index, tau A, uh, this is going to be D tau A plus omega AB wedge tau B and so forth. Uh, if I take the, ex the covariant derivative of a, of a form that has two Lorentz indices, uh, then I'm going to get two factors uh, of the spin connection. And in fact, uh, just like in GR, the sign is going to change depending on whether these are raised or lowered indices. So D of some sigma AB is going to be equal to D sigma AB plus omega AC wedge sigma CB minus, uh, let me get this right, omega CB wedge sigma AC. And so again, the number of omegas appearing depend only uh, on the number of Lorentz indices and not on the rank of the form here. So this is what we mean by a covariant derivative here as well. 
All right, we can relate the covariant derivative to the curvature. in the following way. Uh, so we're used to the expression uh, that the commutator of two covariant derivatives, so say d mu d nu, uh, acting on some vector, a lambda, we can write in terms of Riemann, r kappa lambda mu nu, a kappa. This has the analogous expression in terms of these forms here. So we can write, say, two derivatives acting on a form with one Lorentz index, tau A. This is equal to R A B wedge tau B, like so. Okay. Uh, just a couple more. So uh, let me do it here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in order to do that, you would have to uh, restore the Christoffel connection as well. Yeah. Yeah, you, first, you, I think you would have to go back to index notation, and then you would have to restore the Christoffel. So in GR, uh, we often, we always assume the metricity condition, which is that the covariant derivative of the metric should vanish. In the language of forms, this becomes a very different looking condition, uh, which is that the Lorentz indices uh, of the spin connection should be anti-symmetric with respect to one another. We also often assume the torsion-free condition in GR, uh, which we can express as the lower indices of the Christoffel connection being symmetric with each other. So the anti-symmetric symmetric combination of these two indices should vanish. In the language of forms, this becomes the expression that the covariant derivative of the tetrad, which is equal to DEA plus omega EB wedge EB, this should be equal to zero. So it's a little bit curious, right? Because it seems like these expressions uh, almost flip in terms uh, of form. So here we're saying that the Christoffel has to be symmetric in these two indices. Here we're saying that the spin connection has to be anti-symmetric. Here we're saying that the covariant derivative of the metric vanishes. Here we're saying that the covariant derivative of the tetrad vanishes. Um, but the implications of each one becomes flipped in these two languages. So this I'm always going to assume to be true. Whereas this condition here, uh, I'll be relaxing in various places. So I'm not automatically going to assume, assume torsion-free condition in everything that follows. So relax. <laughs> All right. Let's see. We also have the Bianchi identity. So in usual notation, this can be expressed as a covariant derivative of Riemann vanishing. So anti-symmetrized in these indices. Uh, in terms of this language, this is just the statement that d r a b is equal to zero. Uh, and in fact, this is indeed an identity. So you can see this simply from the definition of r a b. So if you take r a b, you take the covariant derivative according to how we've defined it, and you just massage a little bit, you find that by this definition, this is always automatically satisfied here. OK. Finally, we can get around to writing the Einstein-Hilbert term in this language. Because what we want at the end of the day is an action in terms of these variables. So the Einstein-Hilbert term in our usual notation is d4x 
uh, root g scalar, root g scalar, as a function of g. In terms of these tetrad one forms, this expression is simply the wedge product of the curvature two form with two of the tetrad one forms with all the Lorentz indices contracted by an epsilon tensor, epsilon a, b, c, d. And that's it. And finally, uh, in GR, uh, we also can write down a cosmological constant. Uh, so the CC, D4X root G. And in this language, in fact, the determinant of G is just equal to the wedge product of four of the tetrad one forms, all contracted with an epsilon tensor, so A, B, C, D, like so. Uh, and in fact, let me go through the derivation of getting between this one and this one, because that's going to be useful um, for the other terms that follow. So if I want to go, say, to check that this form is equal to this form here, let me first do that by restoring the index notation. So this is saying E mu A, E nu B, E, let's say, alpha C, E beta D, epsilon A, B, C, D, times D, X, mu, wedge D, X, nu, wedge D, X, alpha, wedge D, X, beta, like so, is equal to this. Uh, so all I've done is written these guys uh, in terms of their components in the one form, uh, because these are just coefficients and not vectors. I can pull them out in front of the one forms that just appear here. All right, but now uh, this quantity here, uh, the wedge product of the four dx's, uh, because this is a four-dimensional space-time, this is always just going to be a product of dx0 times dx1 times dx2 times dx3 uh, with some anti-symmetrization of the indices in front. So in other words, this thing here, in fact, I can write this just as epsilon mu nu alpha beta times dx0, wedge dx1, wedge dx2, wedge dx3, like so. All right, so this, in fact, this is just my usual volume element. So I'm going to call this d4x, whereas the combination of the two epsilons contracted with the four identical matrices, so this, these guys here, this just gives me a determinant of E, like so. So I see this whole thing is just equal to determinant of E, D4X, and because determinant of E is equal to the square root of the matrix G, in fact, this is just equal to root minus G, D4X, like so. All right, so that's just to give you some feel of how to get back and forth uh, between the two. All right, so let's actually look at, at GR uh, in this language. Are there any questions? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, so what's going to happen? Um, so there, there are two ways that you can go about it. So either from the beginning, you can impose this torsion-free condition by hand, in which case that lets you solve for the spin connection in terms of the tetrad. And then you can write the curvature just in terms of the tetrad without the spin connection. Or uh, the way that we're going to do it is we're actually going to treat the spin connection as an independent variable. And then you find the torsion-free condition as an equation of motion. And then you get exactly the same thing. You solve for the spin connection in terms of the tetrad. And you can express the curvature just in terms of the tetrad as well. Yes. I don't know. Um, so, okay, I think, it's, I think it's a beautiful formalism. I think it's a very compact way uh, of writing GR. Unfortunately, I think if you want to calculate anything, like cosmological perturbations, this is not the most efficient formalism for doing this. Um, so it's, it's, I think, most of the time, it's not a very practical formulation for, for calculating things in GR. Um, but it, it sort of gives you insight into the, the geometrical background of it. Yeah. But I think more textbooks should have this. It,
OK, so let's start out with our action in this language. So we're saying that the Einstein-Hilbert action, SEH, we can write roughly, and here I'm just going to drop all factors in front, so all m planks, all factor of 2, just to give you a schematic idea of what's going on. So S Einstein-Hilbert, we said we could write as the integral RAB, wedge EC, wedge ED, epsilon AB, CD, like so. OK, let's note the following things about this action. So first of all, uh, we have an overall Lorentz invariance. So in other words, I can take EA to lambda AB, uh, EB, and similarly, I can take RAB to lambda AC, lambda BD, RCD. And this action is invariant under these transformations, simply because I get four lambdas that appear in front here. When contracted with the epsilon tensor, this gives me a determinant of lambda, and determinant of lambda is one. Um, and so in this way, this action is invariant under these Lorentz transformations. And again, that's important because it's that Lorentz transformation that's responsible for killing the six extra components of the tetrad here, so giving me the right number. All right, so in addition to the overall Lorentz invariance, uh, I have a diffeomorphism invariance, which I'm going to put in quotes because it's not exactly the same as the usual diffeomorphism invariance. And what I mean by this is the following. So I can take the tetrad EA, and I can send it to EA uh, plus covariant derivative D of some scalar, uh, some four scalars, phi A. And sorry, what I mean by scalar here uh, is, in fact, these are, these are four zero forms, uh, phi A, like so. OK, and also in this language, if I'm treating the spin connection as independent, um, then the curvature tensor is not going to transform. So this is just a transformation uh, of the tetrad EA. OK, so now if I do this, I get the following. Um, so the variation delta EH under this transformation uh, is going to look like the following. So it's going to go like RAB, uh, wedge EC, wedge D phi D, like so, epsilon AB, CD. And this is going to be equal to 0 via integration by parts. And that's simply because when the D hits the R, it's going to give me 0 by the Bianchi identity. And when the D hits the E, it's going to give me 0 by these torsion-free conditions as well. So the action is invariant under this, this transformation here. So this is 0 by integration by parts. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So the, um, it's actually straightforward to show because uh, so D only ever hits Lorentz indices. And so when you have, say, D of some uh, tensor, say, T, A, B, C, D, as long as all the indices are contracted, this is just equal to a little d of the same thing. So you can always integrate by parts. That's a good question. OK, but let's see, in fact, uh, so I said this wasn't exactly a diff. Um, so let's see, in fact, what a, a general coordinate transformation looks like in this language. So if you perform a general coordinate transformation, it has the following effect on the tetrad. Uh, so if I let x mu go to x mu plus some psi mu, the transformation of the tetrad is the following. I get the delta EA is equal to D phi A minus lambda AB EB, where I've defined phi A is equal to psi mu contracted with a tetrad, E mu A, and lambda AB is equal to psi mu omega mu AB, like so. So in fact, a general coordinate transformation uh, acts as both this kind of diff invariance in addition to a Lorentz transformation on the tetrad. But because our action is invariant under both of these, it means that the action is also invariant under a general coordinate transformation as well. Okay, 
Uh, let's look at the equations of motion. So again, we're starting from this action here. Uh, and the simplest way to derive the equations of motion uh, is, like I said before, to treat the spin connection as an independent variable. So this is known as first order form. And we'll see that this is equivalent to second order form, which means setting the torsion free condition equal to zero from the beginning. All right, so let's treat the spin connection as independent, and let's first look at the variation uh, with respect to the spin connection itself. So let's look at variation with respect to omega AB. So the only thing on this, in this action that depends on the spin connection uh, is the curvature two form R. So we want to see how this varies uh, with omega. So delta of R AB, this is equal to D of delta omega AB. And then using the definition, the rest of the definition of the curvature, this is equal to delta omega AC wedge omega CB plus omega CB, sorry, AC wedge delta omega CB like so, but in fact, because I have these two uh, wedge products with the curvature, sorry, with the, the spin connection, this is just equal to the covariant derivative of D omega AB, right? So now if I look at the variation of the action with respect to the spin connection, I have delta S goes like D delta omega AB, wedge EC, wedge ED, epsilon, uh, ABCD. And so again, using integration by parts, uh, I see that setting this equal to zero corresponds to the expression that DEC, wedge ED, epsilon ABCD is equal to zero. Um, and, it's, and it's somewhat non-trivial, uh, but you can massage this equation enough, so massage the indices, such to show that this is uniquely solved uh, by the torsion-free condition, DEA is equal to zero. All right, which is to say that we could have imposed this by hand from the beginning, uh, and we would have found the same equations of motion. All right, but now we should also vary with respect to the spin connection. So if you vary with respect to EA, now we have delta S, EH is gonna go like R, A, B, wedge E, C, wedge delta E, D, epsilon A, B, C, D. All right, so now our equation of motion uh, is just gonna be R, A, B, wedge E, C, epsilon A, B, C, D is equal to zero, like so. Uh, and after massaging, you can show that this is equivalent to the Einstein's equation as well. All right, and I think I'm gonna skip showing that explicitly. Um, but let's see, just to, just to make a little bit of connection with the usual results. Um, so here I've suppressed all space-time indices. Um, so I can restore them in this expression here. So this expression here, if I restore my space-time indices, this is telling me that 
uh, D mu E nu A, D X mu wedge D X nu is equal to zero. But the only thing that's important here is just the fact that the wedge product enforces the anti-symmetry of the mu and nu indices. So in fact, this is just equivalent to saying that the anti-symmetric combination d mu e nu a has to be equal to zero. All right, so that's just what it looks like in terms of usual indices. OK. Are there any questions about this? Yeah? Uh, yeah, so if, if you write down uh, non-Einstein-Hilbert terms uh, and use this first-order formalism, you'll have torsion. Um, but generically, torsion is going to come with extra propagating degrees of freedom. Um, and so it's not going to describe the, the representation that you want, necessarily. So... Yes, if you switch, yeah, if you switch to Nabla, then you also have to introduce uh, Christoffels as well. But yeah, that's that's right. Yeah. Sorry, let me take a sec. Yeah, no, sorry, I think that's correct. You can just interpret it as a Nabla. Yeah. Okay, so so far this is just sort of uh, a rewriting. Uh, of the usual equations of general relativity. Uh, but in fact, this formalism has already found its place uh, in a, in a non-trivial extension of general relativity uh, that goes by the name of love log gravity. So in 1971 and 1972, David Lovelock looked for extensions of general relativity um, that are higher order polynomials in the curvature tensor, um, but constrained so that the equations of motion remain second order uh, in the metric. So the reason why you want equations uh, that remain second order in derivatives uh, is that generically higher order equations of motion, uh, basically you can think of it means that you're going to have to specify more Cauchy data. So in other words, you have extra degrees of freedom in your theory. By demanding that the equations of motion remain second order, uh, it means that you propagate the same number of degrees of freedom as the original theory. Uh, and in particular, you expect a theory with no, no ghosts or no extra degrees of freedom. So we'll, we'll talk about uh, the relationship between these two uh, more carefully later. Um, but let's just, let's just consider this requirement here. So basically, he was looking at terms of the form. So s is equal to mp squared over 2, d4x, root gr. Uh, but then also wanted to add terms of the form, say, root g r squared, or root g r mu nu alpha beta, r mu nu alpha beta, and so forth, like so, by enforcing this requirement. All right, and what he found was the following.
So in D equals four space-time dimensions, there are only three such terms that you can write down. Um, and these can be expressed very nicely uh, in terms of this formalism that we just introduced. So all the terms with second order equations of motion are of the form dA, wedge EB, wedge EC, wedge ED, epsilon A, B, C, D. So this was just our cosmological constant that we introduced before. You can write down, like we said, R A B, wedge E C, wedge E D, epsilon A B C D. So this was just our Einstein Hilbert term. Or, in fact, there's a third term that you can write down, which looks like R A B, wedge R C D, epsilon A B C D, like so. And this term, in index notation, is what goes by the name of the gauss bonnet term. So this looks like d4x root minus g, and then you have r squared minus 4 r mu nu, r mu nu, plus r mu nu rho sigma, r mu nu rho sigma, like so. So this term satisfies this criteria that the equations of motion remain second order in derivatives. Uh, however, in four dimensions, this term is a purely a topological surface term. So it doesn't actually contribute um, to the physics. And in fact, in this notation, it's really easy to see why that would be the case. So if we vary this action here, so if we look at delta of r wedge r, this is going to look like r wedge d of delta omega. And then by integration by parts, this d is going to always hit an r, which is going to give me 0 up to a surface term as well. So in d equals 4, this is just a surface term. All right, but something interesting happens when you go to higher dimensions. So in dimensions higher than d equals 4, this turns out to be a legitimately new term that contributes to the physics the equations of motion of your theory. Sorry, say it again. I'm sorry, I don't, I haven't, I'm having trouble hearing your question. <laughs> Can you say? Yeah. I've written down um, terms like R, A, B, which E, A, which E, B, or, so, because here the Hodge dual is involved, right? Yeah, so you're, you're talking about writing down terms like R, A, B, which, which e, e, A, B, which, oh, yeah, exactly. E, A, uh, Wedge and also for the other one, the third one. Yeah, so uh, let's see. I think in general, uh, these are going to be equal to zero, right? Because of the, the anti-symmetric property. So you're, you're basically, you're taking the, sorry, let me think about this a sec. I mean, so, so actually, no, 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 sorry. RAB is symmetric. Oh, no, sorry. RAB is anti-symmetric right. in these two indices. Um, so if you anti-symmetrize, this will give you a minus sign and then redefine. No, no, no this is okay. Yeah. Um, I think the issue is that these might be parity violating terms uh, if you work them out. Um, I'm not sure what the, what the physics of these are exactly. Yeah, but I, I think it's possible that. And, and what would it be in the metric formalism in the second order formalism? Uh, in second order form. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I guess you could just naively restore the indices, right? So you would get something that looks like this. So you would have uh, R, A, B, mu, nu, uh, say some E, alpha, A, E, beta, B, uh, epsilon, mu, nu, alpha, beta, something like this. Um, and you could probably pull out some, some determinant of E in front. And so it would just be some new way of, of contracting the indices. Um, but let me, yeah. 
And we had similar thing for the second option, RAB wedge, RAB down. That's right. No, that's right. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess if you want the requirements of diff invariance, uh, second order equations of motion, Lorentz invariance, uh, and probably uh, parity uh, conservation as an additional requirement, you're really forced to, to write down these three terms. Um, but yeah, but there are other, other possibilities. Yeah. yeah, I have to think about this more. Okay, so uh, if we extend this story to higher dimensions, uh, what we find is that this Gauss-Bonnet term becomes a legitimate new term. So we, if we look at d equals five, uh, the answer to the question that, that Lovelock posed is again you have the cosmological constant, so E A B, uh, sorry, E A wedge E B wedge E C wedge E D uh, wedge E E, all contracted with an epsilon. You have the Einstein-Hilbert term, uh, R A B wedge E C wedge E D, now with a third. E, E, epsilon A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, E. But now the Gauss-Binet term takes the following form. Uh, you have R, A, B, wedge R, C, D, wedge E, E, epsilon A, B, C, D, E, like so. All right, and now this term is no longer purely a surface term, and yet it still has this requirement that the equations of motion are second order in derivatives. So in higher dimensions, in other words, um, there are these extensions of general relativity uh, that preserve the number of degrees of freedom of the theory. And in fact, you can extend this story uh, to even higher dimensions. So in D equals six, you can also introduce a term that looks like the wedge product of three Rs. But in D equals six, this is also gonna be purely a surface term. However, in D equals seven, there's a natural extension of this term, which is the wedge product of three curvatures with one tetrad. And now this is in fact a new extension. So this is a new dynamical term. And so forth in higher dimensions. All right, so, so the story is the following, that, that these extra terms exist, these natural generalizations of general relativity uh, in higher dimensions, and they can be formulated in a particularly simple way uh, using this wedge product formulation. Um, so in particular, we see that in the example of the Gauss-Bonnet term, this looks like you have somewhat arbitrary coefficients appearing in front of the combination of these three terms, whereas in terms of the wedge product, it's very naturally expressed as just a wedge product of two curvatures. Um, and so this, this simplifies our notation a bit. All right, questions about this? Yes. Sorry. Ah, yeah. So I, I, that was the that was the dot dot dot. Um, that includes everything else. But yeah, you can you can have the arm you knew arm you knew as well. Yeah. Sorry. How do you transform it yes. uh, under? But I know, I'm sorry, could you say? Thanks. Oh, it's part of the Gauss-Bonnet term. Yeah, so it, it, it belongs as part of the Gauss-Bonnet term. I mean, all these, all these terms are yes, still yes. diff invariant. Uh, uh, and uh, maybe you can write how we, uh, you can write this term in your notation. Uh, uh, just you mean just the arm you knew, arm you knew one? Yes. Uh, yes. So so the answer is I mean in, in this notation this is sort of the unique term that you can write down that involves the wedge product of two curvature two forms and that this gives you only this term. So in this notation you can't really extract just the arm you knew, arm you knew part. 
if you go to index notation, you have more flexibility and you can write these things down. Um, but the statement is that, that if you just stick to wedge products of this form, um, this is the unique quadratic term that you can write down. Are you saying that uh, it's obvious that once written in this form, uh, the equations of motion are second order, or you're saying that it turns out to be? It turns out to be. It turns out to be. It's somewhat non-trivial to show, I think. Yeah. yeah. Other questions? OK. So in the last 15 minutes, uh, I finally want to get back around to massive gravity. So in a sense, we're asking a question that's very similar uh, to the question that Lovelock posed. Uh, so can we write down interacting nonlinear theories uh, of a massive graviton that propagate no extra degrees of freedom? Uh, so no, no ghost-like terms. Uh, and the answer to this question is yes. Uh, so we call this section five. And this brings us around to DRGT massive gravity. And we want to answer the question of, um, are, is there a nonlinear theory of massive gravity that only propagates five degrees of freedom? All right, so in order to do this, uh, we're going to again use uh, this tetrad notation. Uh, we're also going to introduce, so we have a, dyna a dynamical metric, g mu nu, which we're saying we can write as e mu a, e nu b, a to a b. Uh, and we define the equivalent tetrad one form, EA, is equal to E mu A dx mu. We're also, like we said before, we need to introduce uh, a non-dynamical reference metric in this theory in order to write down mass terms. Uh, so for now, I'm going to take this just to be a flat Minkowski reference metric, simply because I want a Lorentz invariant theory at the end of the day. So my Minkowski reference metric, I'm going to take to be A to mu nu. So this is just a fixed metric that appears in the theory. Uh, I'm going to denote this by a tetrad that's basically delta mu a, delta nu b, a to a b. Uh, and I'm going to denote the corresponding one form uh, simply by a matrix 1 a, which is equal to delta mu a dx mu, like so. All right, so now the nonlinear theories of massive gravity uh, that are free of the Boulevard Desert Ghost take the following form. So you have your action is going to contain the usual Einstein-Hilbert term. So in this language, R, A, B, wedge E, C, wedge E, D, epsilon A, B, C, D, like so. And in addition, you're going to have terms uh, that mix, that now contain no derivatives, uh, but mix the dynamical tetrad one form with the non-dynamical tetrad one form, and that are simply going to be every possible way of wedging together these two one forms. So the mass terms will look like the following. So let me write this as mp squared, m squared integral, sum from n equals 0 to 4 beta n times these functions sn that depend on ea and 1, like so, uh, that are defined the following way. So s0, uh, maybe I shouldn't use s, uh, let me call them m. M0 is going to be the wedge product of every dynamical one form, which, as we said, this is just a cosmological constant. Uh, so this is dead E. But now M1, we're going to wedge together three dynamical guys with one non dynamical guy, D, epsilon A, B, C, D. M2 is going to be the wedge product of two dynamical ones uh, with two non-dynamical reference metrics, like so, epsilon A, B, C, D, and so forth. So M3 is going to be equal to EA wedge 1B, wedge 1C, wedge 1D, epsilon A, B, C, D, and M4 is equal to it's a non-dynamical term, but I'm just putting it in for completeness, uh, the wedge product of all four 
of the non-dynamical guys. Like so. And so this is what ghost-free massive gravity looks like um, in a very similar form to the Lovelock terms that we derived. So in this notation, uh, it's not obvious to show uh, why this propagates the right number of degrees of freedom. Um, but in fact, we can go through and, and I'll show you, I'll give you a general outline of the proof of why this is the case. Um, but this is just to show you that the structure that leads to the ghost-free theory for massive gravity is, is a very close parallel with the structure uh, that led to a ghost-free theory for these non-trivial extensions of general relativity as well. All right, so just to say a few words about this theory. Sorry, I have till 10.45, is that correct? Okay. So just to count free parameters in this theory, So I'm starting with a theory that contains a Planck mass, which I have to specify. Uh, I'm allowed to include also this cosmological constant here, uh, so a coefficient that appears in front of this M0 term. So lambda, like so. As we said, this last term, the M4, uh, is non-dynamical, uh, and so doesn't contribute to the equations of motion. So I'm left with three terms here that represent genuine mass terms for this theory. And they appear with independent coefficients. So beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3. Uh, I can take one of these coefficients and I can absorb it into the mass of the graviton. So I can define some little m. But then I'm left with two remaining dimensionless coefficients. So say beta 2 and beta 3 as well. So this is why you hear people sometimes referred to as, as these DRGT theories as being a two-parameter family of massive gravity theories. Because on top of the Planck mass, the cosmological constant, and the graviton mass, you have these two independent parameters as well. All right, and since I just have a few minutes left, um, maybe the last thing I'll do uh, is just take these terms and switch back uh, to index notation, uh, just to give you a sense of, of what these look like uh, in a less formal language. All right, so we've said uh, that M0 looks like just determinant of E. I can restore indices now on the rest of these terms. Uh, so write E mu A, dx mu, take the wedge product, uh, massage things to pull out a determinant in front. Uh, and I'm going to introduce the following notation. So I'm going to use square brackets to denote the trace of a matrix. Uh, so in particular, say square bracket of E inverse 1, this would be equal to E mu A delta mu A, something like this. All right, so M1, M0 goes as determinant of E. M1 looks like uh, determinant of E times trace E inverse 1. M2 looks like 1 half determinant of E times trace E inverse 1 squared minus E inverse 1 quantity squared trace, like so. M3 goes like 1 sixth determinant of E. Uh, so now we're going to have E inverse 1 cubed minus 3 trace E inverse 1 times trace E inverse 1 squared plus twice E inverse 1 cubed, like so. Uh, and for M4, this is going to go like 1 over 24, determinant of E, and now some combination of four powers of the E inverse 1 traces. So there's going to be an E inverse 1 to the fourth. And let me see if I have this in my notes.
Okay, I only got, no, I think I have it. Here we go. Minus, okay, so there's a six E inverse E squared, trace E inverse, sorry, E inverse one, quantity squared. Uh, there's a three E inverse one squared squared. Uh, and then there's an eight. Uh, so trace of one, trace cubed, uh, and then minus six, trace to the fourth, like so. All right, and in fact, so this, this structure is something that you can keep continuing um, to higher dimensions, but the idea is that, that these terms are really related to the determinants of matrices in various dimensions. So in fact, uh, in one dimension, this is just the determinant uh, of the matrix E inverse one, this piece here. In two dimensions, this would be the determinant of a two by two matrix. In three dimensions, this is the determinant of a three by three matrix, and so forth. Um, and in fact, these expressions vanish. Um, they're identically zero. If you try and take, if you plug in, uh, say, a four by four matrix into the expression for the, the determinant of a five by five matrix. And so that's why this series terminates uh, at this order, yeah. Oh, yeah, let me, let me go through it. Um, I, yeah, I completely skipped the, the connection between the two. All right, so if I look at M1, so, and I restore indices, so this is gonna give me, uh, let's do it this way. So I can write it as epsilon mu nu alpha beta, epsilon a, b, C, D, and then I'm going to have an E mu A, E nu B, uh, E alpha C, one beta D, like so. All right, and I can use the fact um, that I can write, say, uh, determinant of E uh, times uh, the inverse matrices, so some E, let's do, uh, what's the best way to do this? Row uh, F, uh, E sigma G, E lambda H, E kappa I, something like this. Uh, I can write this. This is simply epsilon rho sigma lambda kappa, like so, uh, epsilon uh, F, G, H, I. So I can use this expression to plug in here, um, and I'm gonna get that, so every time uh, an inverse tetrad hits a usual tetrad, it's gonna give me a delta, basically, um, except for the last one where I'm gonna have an inverse tetrad hitting the identity matrix, and that's gonna give me the trace. Um, and so it's, it's just a matter of, of massaging this, pulling out the determinant in front, um, and you end up with, with these different powers here. Um, but the, the interesting thing about this expression, um, so, so the, the right-hand side doesn't depend at all on what matrix I'm using. So I could have pulled out a debt E in front, or I could have pulled out a debt one in front instead, and these expressions would have had a different form, um, but they would have been entirely equivalent to each other. Um, but I'm just doing it like this to put it, to put it in the more familiar form. All right, so next time uh, we'll go through and we'll talk about um, how to show that these are in fact ghost-free theories of massive gravity, uh, but why don't I stop here for now.